Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today in this video we're going to be going over the suggestions past the developers for June of 2021 and we're going to have a look at the naval stuff and helicopter stuff together because there aren't a ton of articles. So far in the ground and aviation portion there's actually been a lot of interesting vehicles so hopefully that is continued with these ideas. The first one is from Azens, and it's talking about the Kusu-class patrol frigate for the Japanese. Now, there's actually a pretty interesting history uh, behind machines like this, and it's actually really nice that Azens goes through it. So we start off our journey on the 2nd of September 1945. All of the Japanese armed forces were obviously disarmed post-World War II. The general staff of the Imperial Japanese Navy was also dissolved on the 15th of October. And then on the 30th of November, the Ministry of the Navy was also dissolved. But one thing um, which was handled by the Navy, which was incredibly important, was the coastal police activity. This was there to be able to uh, stop, obviously, issues which happened at sea, uh, whether it be immigration issues or other illegal activities such as trafficking or anything like that. And uh, basically, there was a bunch of other problems as well, such as the fact that there were thousands of sea mines in the seas around Japan um, because of the threat of imminent invasion during World War II. So therefore, in 1948, Occupy Japan created a new agency or board known in English as the Maritime Safety Board or the Maritime Safety Agency. And this eventually would become in 2001 known as the Japanese Coast Guard. And around that time, there was uh, IJN officers who were planning on rearming the naval elements of Japan. And in 1951, former Imperial Japanese Navy officers and also Rear Admiral Arle Burke made plans on rearming the naval stuff with USA proposed leased vehicles. Uh, so very similar to the Lend-Lease program we had in World War II with Britain and the USSR and a few others. The Japanese government at the time created the Y Committee to decide the plan on naval rearming in secret and then the Maritime Safety Board at the time uh, went on to found a new uh, set of ideas and this meant that uh, they wanted to push forward with the leased ships idea. And then on the 4th of February 1952, the US military advisors decided to select the leased plan, basically, that was put forward to them. So in that plan, the Coastal Security Force will be part of the Maritime Safety Board, and this would become the Maritime Security Force, and therefore wouldn't be under control of the heads of the Maritime Safety Board. So it would be its own little entity to be able to look after the uh, shores of Japan. Now, how does this all fit in with the Kusu class? Well, the Kusu class was one of these vehicles that was, um, uh, the Kusu class frigates, uh, patrol frigates, was one of those vehicles that was used by these guys to be able to patrol uh, these areas. And the Kusu class is a United States Navy Tacoma class frigate. Uh, there were 28 ships which were lend leased to the Soviet Pacific Fleet during World War II, but after the war, those ships were returned and moored at Yokosuka port. And in 1952, uh, there was 18 of them there, and they were leased to this coastal safety force. And uh, some of them were used as headquarter ships, other ones were used uh, for extended radio uh, usage, and others were even used as target drones um, for, I'm guessing, training. The weapons on these machines, they had three 3-inch three Mark 22 guns, three 40mm single uh, cannons, uh, nine 20mm cannons, one hedgehog launcher, eight depth charge launchers, and then it had two depth charge drop rails as well, and the FCS found on it was the Mark 51 Mod 2, and the rangefinder being a 2.5 mile uh, rangefinder or meter, I'm not entirely sure. Had a bunch of different radars and sonars, 
numbers on it as well. Overall, a pretty decent ship and would be very nice to see for the Japanese and maybe the Americans as well in the future. Conte Baraka comes in with a really interesting ship which could actually get put into a ton of different tech trees, uh, but the one which we're focusing on here is Italy, and Italy does make the most sense, I must say. But just, just to put it into context, this is the Sebenico, and it could be put in technically the French tech tree, if that ever gets put into the game, the German tech tree, the Soviets or the USSR tech tree, and also as well, um, it could uh, get put in the Italian tech tree. This thing could be shared around all over the place, um, which is a kind of interesting. So the Sebenico started life as a Royal Yugoslav destroyer by the name of Biograd. Um, it was the lead ship of the class of the three destroyers, and it was built in France, where the sister ships were actually built in Yugoslavia, the Jubdiana and the Zagreb. It was laid down in 1936 and then completed in 1939. But the way that this thing is entangled with Italy is very interesting. It fought against the Italians in the invasion of Yugoslavia in 1941. It was then damaged by Italian aircraft and had to go to the Bay of Kotor for some repairs. Then, because of the advancing forces of the Italians, it was captured by the Italians. The Italians decided to refit it and then repair it and rename it from Biograd to the Sebenico, and completing the uh, refits and repairs in August of 1941. The destroyer would go on to run over a hundred convoy escort missions over a two-year period for the Regia Marina when the Italians then signed the armistice in September of 1943. It was then captured by the Germans, which then renamed it to the TA-43. It served in the Adriatic under German control up until April 1945, and unfortunately the fate of the ship is not entirely known. It's likely it was scuttled in Trieste by the Germans and was broken up for scrap in 1947, but there is some debate around those ideas. The main armament of the Sebenico would be four single-mounted 120mm Skoda guns, two dual-mounted 40mm Bofors, eight single-mounted 20mm Breda cannons, and then two single-mounted 15mm ZB-60s, which is a really interesting gun, which I hope we see more of, and then also had two triple mounts of 550mm torpedo tubes. As someone who's had quite a lot of fun in the Italian Navy, especially the lower-end cruisers, it would be nice to see more destroyers here. And this one is it's just got a fantastic little story because it was passed around so much. It'll be interesting to see where it ends up when it comes to War Thunder. Nicholas Konku has another helicopter for Italy, the Augusta Bell AB412 Griffone, or Griffon, or Griffon, however it is. Uh, this is once again an American-born helicopter in the hands of Italy. Its story does begin in America, as it was a development of the Huey family, more specifically the Bell 212. Two of the helicopters would undergo a series of modifications in the 1970s, which brought them to the prototype stage of the 412. Changes included a new composite four-blade main rotor, and other minor improvements that helped the helicopter be a powerful aircraft. It would be shown to the American High Command, which promptly put it into service. The way Italy comes into play is in 1981, around about 10 years after the Americans accepted. Augusta signed a contract with Bell, which allowed a licensed production version of the 412 helicopter to be made in Italy under the designation of Augusta Bell AB412. After the first batch of civilian versions, Augusta specialists would continue to develop the AB412 for the Italian army, who showed great interest in the vehicle itself. This would finally lead to what we know as the Augusta Bell AB412 Griffon. One of the many upgrades uh, that 
that was made to the vehicle in comparison with the civilian model. It had a reinforced chassis. Uh, this was done to absorb the shocks during a hard landing. The cockpit had shock absorbing partially armored seats and a number of important onboard systems would also be covered with armor. In terms of speed, it used the PT-63B turbo twin pace engine, and this allowed it to reach a maximum speed of 259 kilometers per hour. One of the many other improvements on the helicopter was the benefit of the addition of screen exhaust devices that reduced the thermal signature of it. This would mean it would be harder to spot if someone was using a thermal size. Flares could also be installed on the vehicle. It didn't have any onboard radar, however. A singular vehicle would mount the CRS, uh, CRESO, the Complesso Radar Eliportato Soviglianza, uh, Obiettivi radar, there you go, <laughs> although not much was done with it due to it being a bit too complex and also expensive. It would be used in various training exercises, but it was never actually put into active service. In terms of armaments, the Italian army usually only mounted various rocket launchers, machine guns, but with the Augusta, when they were looking to export the machine, it was revealed in various military expos that it could also mount such things such as a 25mm cannon and tow ATGMs if needed. In terms of service and vehicle usage, the Italian army would be its main user for many years, starting from 1987 and currently still in service with the majority parts of the Italian military. In the Italian army, it was used in Iraq, being used as reconnaissance, troop transports and search and rescue, and also has been used in other armies and uh, been exported to countries such as Tunisia, Mexico and even Peru. Uh, so you can see that this vehicle has a lot of stuff uh, which it has been able to do. There's also a few other armaments uh, that it could have access to. So we talked about the dual 25mm Orlikon, the KBA, uh, then it could also have a 12.7mm on the nose turret, the Lucas helicopter gun turret with 400 rounds, uh, 8 AGM, uh, ATGM BGM 71 toes, uh, it could carry some sea skewer anti-ship missiles and air-to-air -air missiles in the form of stingers or Mastra Mistrals, anti-radar missiles as well, or at least the launchers, and then also rocket pods and flares and everything like that. It could uh, definitely be able to carry a bunch of different ordnance when it comes to War Thunder. Atomer brings us an abomination in the form of the Durand G20. This is a Second World War era French helicopter, uh, which is definitely interesting. Its story begins in 1938, where René Durand and also Marcel Vuem uh, quit Breguet and decided to create their own company, the Société Française du Gyroplane the SFG. It's pretty simple. Because at the time, the French Air Army was actually asking for a helicopter with high performances for the period. They wanted it to be an anti-submarine anti aircraft to reach 250 kilometers an hour, to have a range of 800 kilometers, and also to be transported by the submarine Circou. So uh, why uh, did they decide to do this? because uh, helicopters were kind of the rage at the time, and uh, they were looking for something to be useful. So Durand made a prototype. The helicopter itself had two coaxial rotors. It had a V empennage, uh, which was made in canvas, a steel cabin, and also a cockpit, which was made of plexiglass. The helicopter um, was powered by two Renault 6Q04s, which had 240 horsepower. Um, it had a special gearbox, so if the engine was destroyed, the power of the other engine would be distributed to the other two rotors, so therefore it would still be able to run and uh, avoid crash, um, because this thing had two separate sets of rotors on it, very similar to what you see on the Wyvern or the K50, um, but World War II France. 
Um, <laughs> and also, uh, the armament uh, on it is uh, kind of hilarious <laughs> when it comes to it. So what would this armament be on an aircraft like this? Well, it would have at least one machine gun on the left-hand side. That is right. One machine gun on the left-hand side, and maybe it could carry depth charges or maybe bombs. Uh, so there you go. Um, there is also, in the axis of the rotors, there is also a gunner. Um, so you could pop his head out of the top, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, when the reason this at least was supposed to be part of the first project, but by the time that they created the prototype, they realized that that was impossible um, because of the idea of sticking your gunner where the blades are turning around might be a bad idea. Um, so luckily, from, from project to prototype, they realized this was a terrible idea. Another reason why project vehicles are insane. Then uh, the lower rotor was smaller than the higher rotor, uh, so they wouldn't uh, be able to touch themselves. And they continued uh, to build the prototype. But the problem was, well, the Second World War. In 1940, the Battle of France was lost. Uh, when Germany discovered the helicopter, they thought it was nothing important, and they authorized them. They authorized them to actually finish the prototype. It was finished in 1947 after the war without any armament. And the first ground test began, but it serves it didn't serve anything um, after the war because well technology was in a much better place, especially when it came to helicopter designs. No pilots wanted to fly this helicopter, so it was destroyed without actually flying at all. So it never had its test flight. It never had any armament attached to it, but maybe it could have had a machine gun and some bombs, and maybe it could have flown at some point. So, yeah, as I said, a pretty crazy abomination from the French. Um, maybe a funny event or something vehicle, but, yeah, it's just kind of crazy. Anyway, that is the naval stuff and the helicopter stuff for June 2021. I hope you have enjoyed this video. And I'll see you next time. I'd like to thank BRFC, Swollen Ostrich, Teddy, John Ryman, Universe, Conte Baraka, Eugens Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, Lafouche, Barine, and Samuel Schlick for supporting the channel.